Hello and welcome to Irish Football Fan TV. I'm delighted to be joined by Newcastle Jets football club player, Roy O'Donovan. Roy, how are you keeping over in Australia? Pretty good, Paul. Thanks for having me on. No problems. Um, so look, we we said we get uh, players on and they're talking about their careers and stuff like that because obviously everyone's in isolation all around the world and it's something nice for people to look back on. So do you want to talk me through your earliest memories of football? Earliest memories of football, look, back to my very young days playing for uh, Leeds, my junior club back in Cork, uh, under eight street leagues. Uh, I always remember my team was uh, Tottenham Hotspur. So at that time, Jorgen Klinsmann was the big star. So I wanted to be Jorgen Klinsmann, score all the goals. And literally, I had the, I had the bug then from then, you know, playing with what, seven aside it was. Had the bug, joined up Leeds then under nines. And played, you know, your street league football into schoolboy football, and ah, look, there's nothing like schoolboy football, is it? Looking back at it, lobbing, lobbing the keeper every week, you know, from about forty yards, they couldn't reach the crossbar, so it was great. It's got plenty of goals. So I take it I was going to ask you who your who your football idol kind of was growing up. It must be Klinsman, was it? Well, he'd be one of them. Anyone to score goals, really. But uh, I was a big Man United fan, so Eric Cantona would have been. A big, I would have been a big fan of Eric and, and obviously Roy Keane as well, being from Cork, captain of Man United and all that, Ireland. So, uh, yeah, he would have been a big idol of mine as well. And the Brazilian Ronaldo, any, to be honest with you, mate, what anyone, player. yeah, unbelievable. Anyone who scored goals, I was interested in. So, it's mad because I, nearly every player I, I've had on that's Irish is kind of within, I suppose, uh, within the same kind of similar ages. All oh, Roy Keane, Roy Keane, even Jason Malumbi um, on, on Friday, Roy Keane, everyone says Roy Keane. I suppose that goes down to show what an influence he had. I mean, obviously the Premier League was huge and, you know, televised and stuff like that. But even players that he's uh, played with in the past, all of them in Premier League teams of the uh, of all time and all this type of stuff. Like, it's mad. A lad from Cork in Ireland going on to have such a huge impact and probably going down as, if not the best, one of the best midfielders in the Premier League here. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And look, I suppose it's a great story as well that he kind of, he had missed the boat. He was 19 and he was playing for Cove Ramblers in, in the League of Ireland. And, you know, he got a, a chance to go to Nottingham Forest and, you know, didn't he take it with both hands? He was obviously done great for Nottingham Forest. And then at the time he went to Man United, it was the highest transfer fee. And, you know, by the time he finished at Man United, he was the captain. He had all these trophies and medals and he was just like, a, you know, like a kind of a rocky character. So it, it is an inspirational kind of story as such as well, coming from such a, you know, a normal background in in, in Ireland. So uh, yeah, I think ev ev that resonates with everybody, you know. Yeah, and especially yourself being from Cork, who's obviously a massive hero being a, you know, a Cork man yourself. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and that's it as well. I mean, if a fella from around the corner can do it, it gives you that hope and that drive to, you know, to want to play the Premier League and want to, you know, do all these things and achieve the highest you can, you know. So if he can do it, why can't I? And I think Jason Malumbi and, and all the other people that he's had an influence on, you know, it's, it's fantastic. You hear a lot of rugby and gap players as well. I think he's got a, he's a little bit of a, a sports icon in Ireland as well. And I suppose that has a lot to do with the, the hype machine that is the Premier League and when, it, especially at, at his pomp in, in the 90s, you know. Yeah, one hundred percent. Well, look, uh, talk me through your your schoolboy years because you were saying there about you kind of got up to under tens, and uh, so from kind of that point up until when you started getting noticed uh, and and so on your first pro contract. So I imagine mm -hmm. that was kind of your early teenage years. Yeah, it's going back a few years now, so I just try and rattle through here in my head. But uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, so look, I, I my most of my schoolboy football I played for for Leeds, and uh, I was always a striker. I was always the little kid, you know, small but quick. So, uh, you know, I had to fight my corner a little bit. Um, but look, I scored, scored plenty of goals and I, I got my first trial. Um, Donny Buckley would have been involved with Leeds at the time. So he was a scout for Wolves. I went off to Wolves when I was 11, which was very exciting. Uh, Robbie Keane would have been kind of breaking through at the time there as well, kind of thing, around that time when I was 11 or 12. And... Uh, so that look again that in itself was inspirational as well. But I, I was going over and back there every summer and and um, and Easter for, for a few years, and then with the Cork team in the Kennedy Cup, 
on the 13, just kind of leading into that. I broke my my ankle in the game. So that that kind of set me back a little bit, to be fair. I, I got back and played in the Kennedy Cup, but it set me back with regards Wolves. So it kind of went from a situation where they were going to sign me, it was kind of nailed on, they were going to sign me to they were unsure. So, um, yeah, then kind of Coventry kind of came in when I was 15. I went on one trial there. Uh, it worked out. I, I done well on the trial and they offered me three years as a professional and a year as a YTS. But also there was another six, seven lads coming over from Ireland as well. We were all going to live in digs. So it was brilliant. It was an opportunity for me to uh, kick out my football and, you know, make some new friends along the way as well. But uh, the only kind of drawback looking at it now, I was probably a bit young, 15, leaving home, leaving school, leaving your friends and family. It was it was difficult, you know, and, and homesickness. I know plenty of people have said it to you before. That was quite difficult. The first year or two, you're, you're kind of going into professional football environment and it's um, it's serious business and you're living in the digs, you're missing your parents, your friends, the normal thing. And even look, even stuff like coaching. I remember the first day I turned up there, a 15 year old kid, and they, they sent me training with the under 19s. Now, the under 19s had a good side. A lot of them went on to play first team football and played, you know, for their country and in the Premier League and all that. But the coach uh, was a Scottish guy called George Mackey, and he was a uh, he was a tough guy to please. He was uh, from the kind of Gordon Strachan school of, you know, discipline. So we'd done this passing drill, but I had never had real proper coaching back in Cork. It was kind of, you know, a lot of my football would have been played on, on the road, on the street. Uh, and when we went training with Leeds, we, we, to be fair, we won all the schoolboy comps now and all the and we were in a couple of national, uh, national cup finals up in Dublin against St. Joseph's, I think, and uh, a few other very good teams along the way. But never with proper, just kind of, we were just naturally good players and played instinctively off the cuff. But I went over and they'd done this passing drill, which involved about 12 people. You know, you pass it to this corn, cross a hair, he runs around the back of you, crisscross, zigzags, the whole lot. So I'm just trying to trying to get my bearings a little bit, like, you know. And uh, within about 30 seconds, this coach is literally in my face, abusing me, like, what are you doing, man? You're ruining the whole session. Instead, like instead of just kind of saying like step aside and kind of watch how it goes, it was just like I learned the lesson straight away. Like there's no, there was no messing around. Like you kind of had to be on it. But um, yeah, that was that was a big learning curve early on. Was Robbie? Would Robbie have been at Coventry then when you were obviously not breaking through there, but he would have signed after Wolves there. Yeah, he I th- he had probably just left to go to Inter Milan, I think, the, the year before I went. So I think I, I signed there 2001. I think he might have left maybe in the January previously. Um, but again, he he was only there a short time at Coventry as well. And he left, you know, a, a massive mark on that football club. And I think he only played 30 odd games for Coventry. But, uh, you know, they, they spoke very highly of him. Even then, when I, when I came, they were like, hopefully you'll be the next Irish superstar, like, you know. Yeah, they, well, that, yeah, they made that was, of him as well. Though. They made it, they made out twelve million off him as well. I'm not sure they were going to make the same off me at fifteen. <laughs> <laughs> well, it must have been, it must have been nice that they were they're kind of gene you up in that way. But you mentioned there the fact that you were fifteen, you know, away from home, and I don't think enough I don't think enough people realise that or enough young footballers going over think, oh yeah, you know, I seen this lad the Premier League, and they don't know the kind of backstory, you know, the stuff that isn't seen on mm. TV and that's, that's not seen on social media because we all know social media it's it's pretty much the best of everyone if that makes sense but yeah. re- regarding like younger lads going over I don't think they see the hardship it can be like I, I've I've moved away I've, I've lived abroad and it can be hard I was I was living in Australia at 21 and that was hard yeah. like to live even though it's only across the way but at 15 you're only still a boy you're not you're nowhere near you know being a man and at the same time, no family. Now, you said that there was lads from Ireland over which it digs. That must have helped. But at the same time, you're away from all your friends, all your family. And mobile phones and stuff like that weren't huge back then, I'm sure. I, won. I, I can't really remember. But yeah. like there'd be, no, there'd be none of this Wi-Fi or, or any of that type of stuff back then. Exactly. exactly. That's, and that's the thing. There was, there was no FaceTime or Skype that I could get onto my parents all the time. It was We had to share the payphone in the... Uh, in the digs in the evening so you might be lucky to get a half an hour on the phone and you'll be looking around the corner there's people queuing up to speak to their parents in sweden australia 
uh, Ireland, wherever they, wherever they were from, you know. But uh, as you said, it is. It's a, it's a tough game. Look, it's the best job in the world to play football for a living when it's going well. But there's a lot of struggle involved, you know, leaving your family, leaving your friends and that that comfort blanket. And, you know, I was this cocky 15-year-old thinking I'm going to go over there. I know how to play football, you know, I'll get in the first team before I'm 16 and change the world. But uh, it's not that easy. It's, it's, you know, it's a lot of hard graft and you need a bit of luck. You need people to like you uh, along the way as well. And, uh, yeah, it's, look, it's competitive. Even though there was seven or eight of us Irish lads there, um, it's still ultra competitive. So it's kind of even at that age, it's kind of very hard to separate because we were living in, in the training ground as well. We lived upstairs. So we trained in the daytime, um, whatever, double session. We'd do our job. So at the time, you'd either do kit, you'd do the boots, or you'd organise the equipment for the first team or whatever, clean down the footballs or whatever. So I remember like, I was doing boots or whatever. So by the time you get up upstairs to your room at five o'clock, you're, you're kind of done with football. And, you know, if you've had an argument with someone today, you're stuck living with them, you know. So it was kind of, it was, that was kind of hard to kind of get your head around as well from a young age. But, um, Definitely, look, a huge, a huge learning curve in my formative years, and and one that stood to me because it's very easy, very easy. I can see how people fall off the kind of um, the football wagon very quickly because they think I didn't sign up for this. I, I just want to play football and go home to my family. But you know, it's it's not always that easy. And you see a lot of guys go to England and they're the next big thing, and a year or two later they're back in Ireland and they might give League of Ireland a go, and that mightn't happen. And then before they're 19, they're, they're never seen or heard of again. And it's a lot of waste of talent, really. Like So, you know, we've seen, obviously, the likes of Kevin Doyle and Shane Long and, and Wes, who went away later on and benefited from that. They went in mature, they went in as a first-team player, and they were able to handle, handle the move. But, uh, yes, yeah, certainly for me, that first year was, uh, was, was hard and difficult, but it stood to me in, in the long term. Yeah, well, like you said there about, you know... Uh... People going over and coming back. Like we had Nicky Byrne on, on Instagram live the other day from Westlife. Like he played for Leeds and he just came back and he hated football. He came back and played for Shells and Cove Ramblers for a little bit and then just said, look, I'm packing it in. Obviously went off to, to do amazing things with Westlife. But it just shows that it, it can happen as easy as that, you know? Yeah, well, that, and that's simple as that. And in fairness, he's, it wasn't meant for him, but he's gone on to bigger and better things in a different field. You know, not everybody is is that lucky, you know? Um, but it just goes to show, and I think he was he was rated quite highly. I think he was a goalkeeper at, at Leeds, and uh, it's one of these things. He just probably didn't get the break at the right time, and uh, it was probably difficult first team to get into at Leeds. He m- might not have had many options when he was leaving England, and yeah, at the time there wasn't. A, there, I, I spoke to Derek Collin about this recently as well. He was kind of saying at that time in the nineties there wasn't many players coming from the League of Ireland and going back to England. You know, it wasn't wasn't really till Kevin Doyle kind of again that that kind of started happening that people were kind of using as a springboard to kick back onto to something else you know abroad or whatever it was so um yeah so it was difficult and there was probably a lot of talent wasted and lost because of that because maybe people found it hard to deal with the league of Ireland life it was it's a physical quite a bit of physical league as well you know yeah I think Jack Burns came out and said that recently he's just like you know I, I do have tough games when I come back here people kind of say that the, the league of Ireland isn't isn't good quality but it is he he is always fighting the case for the league to be fair to him yeah and he's spot on I, look I think it's a fantastic product there's great players come out of Ireland great school by players and equally so League of Ireland uh, it's, a, it's a tough league I just think it hasn't probably got the support that it's deserved over the last 25 years you know um, we've had 100%. some great yeah we've had some great quality I, I remember when I played in League of Ireland and I'm going to name out a few now but Derry City Shelburne uh, draw the United for a while and our, our ourselves at Cork City had, had players that could have easily and t- a team actually could have easily played in League One lower end of the championship then but I think as, as a league it hasn't probably got the support and that, I mean finance support yeah. and uh, you know all that kind of infrastructure really you know the way the GEA get grants the League of Ireland doesn't get grants so they don't have their own training ground they can't build on anything they don't own their own stadiums and that has a knock on effect then we don't have TV deals and as I said you know, previously, Niall Quinn, I think, is a great appointment. I think what's happening in the FAI at the moment is great. We needed a change. There's no doubt about that. And Stephen Kenny, he's got great history in the in the League of Ireland and the people that he's bringing in. Even like from Colin O'Brien, Jim Crawford, Damien Duff, Keith Andrews, John O'Shea, 
they're all very humble people, you know. They they'll want the best for Irish football. They want to leave a mark. And I think if they're all given time, and I mean this from a football and an admin perspective, I think there's a, a bright future for Irish football. I I couldn't agree more, Roy. To be honest with you, and it's great the fact that you still keep up to up to date with everything regarding what's going on back here. I think that's great, and uh, I think that's again the power of social media. I know we we kind of touched on its negative spot, but it has a positive in terms of you being able to keep up with stuff as well and kind of know what's going on. And as you say, it, it is great that there's been change there, and you know it's been a long, long time coming, but. You have to. We have to get it. Unfortunately, the virus is kind of come at a wrong time because the gate, the gates were up, and the, you know, the attendances were up, and everything was looking really well for a really good season. You know, we had Rovers and Dundalk had that really good game, the three-two early on, and that was yeah. setting up for a really good season. You know, and then this kind of happened. But anyway, um, let's get on to your from Coventry to Cork City and how that kind of happened. Well, look, basically at eighteen. Um... There was a little bit of the time ITV Digital collapsed. That was the big TV deal that the Coventry had been relegated from the Premiership. So basically, me and along with most of the other Irish lads, uh, 99% of the academy got told, you know, you're, you're available on a free transfer, basically, you know, surplus to requirements. And uh, at 18 years old, I kind of, I was kind of hanging, I hung around for a while. I trained there. I said, no, no, I can kind of make this work. I can get back in the picture. But uh, I fought a good fight long enough. And, I had an opportunity uh, through a friend, a friend of mine, actually, Hossein Yazdani, who was in the U team with me at Coventry, uh, a friend of his, a guy called Paddy Waters, who will forever be indebted to, a Dublin lad. He was a scout. He had a good connection and a good contact with Pat Dolan. And Pat Dolan gave me a ring. He wanted to come out and meet the train with Cork City. And they said, can you come out tomorrow morning and do a bit of training? So I said, yeah, no bother. So... Yeah, so I went back to Cork City, back living with my mum and dad, um, which was great, probably what I needed at the time. Uh, but unfortunately, within three weeks, Pat had asked me to sign, but he he had got the sack. And I like I like Pat, I loved his energy, actually. But he had got the sack, I think he had fallen out with the chairman at the time. And uh, Damien Richardson came came in. Now, when Damien... He gives, me, he gives me nightmares as a Shells fan. Yeah, <laughs> there, you go, there you go. He just missed the, out in the league a few times, that's right, yeah, but... Uh, but, da- but da- like Damien came in, and I'm thinking, because I'd seen Damien on the television, and uh, he has all the big words, he's got a great vocabulary. But he always, I remember him being Sham Grover's manager, and he always looked angry. You know, he was always barking orders on the sideline. He, was, he never looked happy, like, you know. And I know he won a few cups at, at Shelburne and all, and I, anyway, that wasn't in my mind, but I'm thinking, I'm not sure he's going to be the manager for me. I'm, I'm not sure is he really going to get me, like, you know. But... He came in, he asked Jerry Harris, the kit man, and Liam Murphy, who was the director of football. He didn't know nothing about me. And he says, um, they said, oh, we've got a lad in on trial. He's kind of in limbo at the moment. Do you want to keep him or not? And he goes, uh, is he quick? And can he score a goal? And luckily enough, they said, yeah, look, he's very quick. He's obviously unproven at first team level. But uh, anyway, they gave me the thumbs up. And uh, it's, it's to be honest with you, it was... It was life changing for me because League of Ireland at that time had just gone professional. There was great hype, especially down in Cork at the time. You had George O'Callaghan and John O'Flynn. There was a bit of hype around them. Obviously, you had Kevin Doyle, uh, who would start to hit some real form as well that, that year. And um, yeah, Damien ended up being a great guy for me, even though we did we did clash. We did clash the odd time, but he had, he had this brilliant knack of. You know, he could call me an arrogant so-and-so on a Friday night if I wasn't pulling my weight. He'd put, put his arm around me on a Saturday and he had this thing, kind of thing that, you know, you couldn't help but like him. I thought he was terrific. And uh, he gave attacking players the freedom to go and play their game and impose themselves on the opposition. Um, and that led him down probably at Shelburne. They probably wanted a bit more structure. But it suited us at Cork. We had the structure from Pat Dolan and they just needed that freedom and attack. So... Um, I think I was a little piece of the jigsaw in 2005 that they hadn't a bit a bit of youth, a bit of speed, uh, and along with a lot of very good players. And uh, yeah, my career went from strength to strength. And just over the two years I was there, I played 100 over 100 games for Cork City in a very quick period of time, and um, scored over 40 goals. So a good goals to game ratio, and you know the fans were great there. But as I said, I owe a lot to Damien and the guys, the players there, that they just got around me and. They had me go from strength to strength, really. 
And there was obviously a, a huge rivalry between Cork and Shells. That's what I was saying about nightmares with Damien because I remember, you know, uh, I used, as a Shells fan going out to talk, I used to hate playing Cork because he's always knew that there was going to be a game. And, and Cork had a real good mentality of being able to go away and get a win, you know. Yeah, yeah. Happy days. I, I, you probably don't like me very much, so, so I'm surprised you took the call today. <laughs> but um, but I, I remember actually really making my name actually against Shelburne because Shelburne were the top team in, in Ireland under, under Pat Fenn and Naaman Collins for a long time. As you spoke previously, Jason Crow or Jason Bourne, Glenn Crow, Wes, Alan Moore, Owen Harry, like you could, the, the list is endless top players that they had. Joey and Doe, Jim Crawford. So there's loads. Um, and a few different kind of characters like Jim, or what's his name, Davy Rogers at the back. But, um, <laughs> but, uh, but I remember the first day of the voodoo over Cork City for a long time under Pat Dolan. Pat Dolan just couldn't get over the line and get that league win for Cork City. But they had, like, they'd done, done everything but they had a great European run. But Shelburne always had the hoodoo for years over Cork City. So my starting debut, I think, or one of my second game, maybe it was up in Tocca Park against Shelburne. So, like, we were a bit psyched up before the game, you know. Now, Damien was quite calm, actually, but the lads, you know, they knew this was a big one. If we were serious about winning the league, you got to get up here, get some points. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of raw to it all. I'm, I'm new, I'm trying to find my feet. But I said to myself, I'm going to, get out there today and I'm going to upset some people. I'm going to show them all about. So um, I upset a few people, mostly Shelburne players. So I upset Owen Harry. I upset Jim Crawford. Uh, and I scored a goal. Now, um, you know, at the time, nobody in Shelburne liked me, but we won the game of Cork City that night. So, you know, it, can, it kind of gave me a little bit of um, status in Cork. I was a first team player. I'd kind of put my kind of... Um, Mark in the sand as such. But uh, I know I know. every time we played against Shells, they used to try and kick lumps out of me, you know, whoever it was. Uh, I forgot Stewie Byrne as well. He was another great player. But, uh, but you know, I must say, as as much as we had a rivalry and we hailed each other at that time, playing against each other, to, like, you know, it's all about winning the league. And um, when we won the league with Cork City, it was, it was outstanding. I really, I'll never forget it. But uh, I have a great respect for all the lads I played against in the League of Ireland. And, Especially the sales boys, but uh, I wouldn't have told them that at the time. But right now, course, looking, yeah. yeah, great, great respect. But uh, whatever, whatever age we could have got that time, whether it was just to be a nuisance and annoy him, especially me, uh, yeah, we were, we were going to use any advantage we could get. Yeah, well, I think at the time it was great for the league that role because it was two teams that really disliked each other. But at the same time, the standard was going up in the league at the time. Do you know what I mean? Because that. That that rivalry and the dislike. I wouldn't. I don't know if you call it hatred. You basically just said it was disliking. So I'm yeah. gonna say disliking. Uh, yeah. But that kind of drove the standard up a bit. You know what I mean? I thought anyway. And I remember going to games. Uh, I was only a young fella back then, and I, I used to love it. Like everything about it was, was brilliant. Yeah, it was great, and it was it was great because we had some great characters in our team. You know, people that could put it around, put it about a bit, but they could give you a bit back verbally as well. And, and Shells were the same. Like, Shells could play like you. As I said, the players they had, they could play. But they had a nasty streak as well. And you don't win. You don't win cha- championships without having that nasty streak. And they, they certainly had that. But uh, as you said, it, it made for look entertain, entertainment for everybody. I thought the league was really on the up then. Um, and then uh, that, that year, went down to the last game of the season. And I think Shelburne finished third, which was probably their, their worst finish in, in about five years. Uh, and it was between ourselves and Derry. Stephen Kenny was the manager of Derry, who again, he was bringing in some very good young players at the time. You had Rory Higgins, uh, Kevin Derry, and uh, the Derry Pele, Paddy McCourt, who was brilliant for all League of Ireland fans, no matter where you were from as well at, the, at that time. He was uh, outstanding. So it was just it was exciting to be a part of League of Ireland that time. And I expected it, when, when I left in 2007, I expected to go from strength to strength. I was expecting, you know, to really kick on and unfortunately obviously we had the global financial crisis and and all that in 2008 professional football really uh really suffered for a few years after that but uh as you said i think it looks i think it's find, finding its feet again now it just needs that bit of support and a bit of a leg up and, and hopefully it gets it yeah well you must have enjoyed the time obviously back playing for cork it's a, it's a hometown club and uh you know winning I think you won Young Player of the Year, then you won Player of the Year, then the following season had a decent run in Europe. 
So I'm, is that, were you thinking then, at that point, were you looking to leave or, or how did the move then to, to Sunderland happen? Well, it was, a, it was a kind of a case of you don't put your ambition away. So I, as much as I love Cork City, and it, when I first signed there and I was playing, I was thinking to myself, I could play here for the rest of my life. It really, at that time, it, it wasn't, if I wanted to be a professional full-time footballer and, and, you know, look after and provide for my family and realistically have a chance of playing for Ireland and, and you know, you know get, get a bit of credibility, you had to leave, which is an awful shame, really, because I really was invested in the League of Ireland and I love Cork and I still love Cork City. You know, that's, that's a part of me. But, um, yeah, it was a case of, really, if you had any ambition to drive all, you, you had to go overseas. And, you know, the more first team games I, I played and I was involved with the Irish 21s at the time and all, they started to get a little bit of hype within the league and within myself when I was 19 years old. So, obviously, that, that kind of gives you a kind of... Um, a platform itself and um yeah I, to be fair Cork City were good they, they weren't any, any any rush to sell me or anything they kind of went down to the wire really they kept me for a year longer than what they could have there, there was a couple of clubs could have signed me in 06 and they were like no no we're, we're comfortable we, we'd like to keep you um and they wanted to get give me to sign a new contract which really probably really wasn't realistic if I wanted to get away because the, the valuation would have went sky high but I think they done all right out of the deal. I think they got between half a million and a million euro, depending on how many parents I went on to play for Sunderland in the end. So I think they done okay at that time, considering where transfer fees have even gone since then in the League of Ireland. So I hope that, again, that's another thing I hope gets better because it's a business at the end of the day. So if we are going to have talent leave the league, and there's plenty of it, they need to be kind of rewarded as well so the, the clubs can reinvest it in, in better players and infrastructure. You know that That probably wasn't the case either, I think. The money they got from me was probably just reinvested in wages, and they went and won the FAI Cup that year as well. But um, yeah, they they obviously suffered a couple of years after that, and now Forest run the football club. Thankfully, you know. Yeah, I think that I think that shows even up until recently with uh, Dundalk and many players they lost, they would lose at the end of a season, and then they'd have to go out and try and find another player. Stephen Kenny, to his credit, was unbelievable at that. You know. Yeah, he, he always has been, and. Look, I, I suppose uh, the, the story with Stephen Kenny as well, he's he done great at Derry. And he's had a few ups and downs like us all, but he's learned his craft. And at Dundalk, they were so unlucky, like with some of the European games, that they, they, they didn't just get over that next level. You know, they were they had some outstanding performances and results in Europe. And in the League of Ireland, like they were, Dundalk, when I was playing in the league, like they were always kind of like a bit of a yo-yo team. They were in the Premier, but they were down in the, in the, in the first division probably most of the time. But he rebuilt that 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 club really from the ground up, and he brought the best young players through there, and and gave people a, a second chance. And like said, Richie Toll and, and and lads like that really kicked on there and scored plenty of goals. But that was great rivalry as well for League of Ireland, Cork City, and and uh, John Coffey yeah. and Stephen Kenny. That was fantastic. That's what you need. You need characters in any league, and it, and I think if you can kind of use that in, in a media sense to kind of to build the brand. Um, then the League of Ireland like could really do well because there's there's plenty of characters in around League of Ireland. Yeah, I think that I think that might be the case now with, with Rovers and Dundalk. Um, that looks like that's going to be the, the the top two for the next while anyway. But um, what was it like knowing that someone who you idolised in Roy Keane was interested in signing you? But did he play a role in the in the transfer getting you over? Did he talk to you or anything, or was it someone else who who came in and spoke to you? No, he did. Uh, he he rang me up out of the blue. I was due to sign for Fulham at the time, um, and he he rang me up, and um, he kind of said, "Can you come down to Jory's in Cork? Uh, I'm over for a couple of days. Come in, have a have a chat with me, and see what you think. No no pressure at all. Just uh, conversation." And it was. I, I went into his room, and it was my first time ever meeting him, and he was he was sound. I sat down, had a chat with him, uh, and he starts talking football, and he kind of wants my feedback on what we all like to play and what I'm all about. And, um, you know, the, the, my history, you know, what had happened in, as an academy player and, uh, into Cork City and all that. So he was, you know, great. And he was funny. It was good to have a chat with him. But the, the fact, as soon as he wanted to sign me, uh, th there was nowhere else I was going to go, really. He was, you know, he was the man in Cork as well. And he said, look, you, you do the business for me. You work hard and training in the games. Uh, I'll give you game time. Um, he said, no promises. You know, I've got a big squad. 
but uh, you know, if you show an eagerness and a, a willingness to work, you'll do fine for me. And he, he was true to his word, to be fair. And um, yeah, so I had, to, I had to ring Fulham the next day, I had to ring Laurie Sanchez and say, look, I'm going to go to Sunderland. And uh, he wasn't too happy. He uh, he called me a few uh, choice words down the phone. So, uh, so yeah, so I, I had to say thanks very much. Uh, all the best I'm going to Sunderland. And I nearly had to hang up the phone while he was still swearing at me. So it was one of those. <laughs> They were just putting it down politely. But um, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but from that kind of point then, you know, you said Roy was true, true to his word. How did you find training under him? And, um, you know, what was it like in terms of getting your chance? Yeah, look, it was everything I thought it would be. It was, it was hard work. Uh, every, every training session uh, was like a match. And I think a lot of fellas you'd speak to that played from at that time, it was like you, you had to earn your place in, in the team, you had to earn your place in the squad, and you had to be at it with Roy. You really had to be at it. And uh, that suited me. I, I, I love hard work. I, I love training. I love wanting to get better. And I'm competitive. So um, every day in training uh, was like a game. So it was, it was, it was kind of mad in a, in a way. There'd be a few tackles going in as well. And, you know, there'd be, there'd be a few kind of... Uh, too close for comfort kind of moments like but I think Roy liked that he liked people being on edge because he didn't want people easy ozy going into match day but um yeah look it was great to work for him I, I, in my opinion it was probably a shame that I didn't get to work for him for longer um uh, the first year I, I played nearly 20 games you know not many starts probably about five starts but it was great I was learning a lot but the end of that first Premier League season I felt like you know I was really getting some headway. I felt good. I felt better in the games as well. I felt like I was starting to have more of an impact. So when I came back for the following second season, pre-season, I trained all the off-season. I said, I'm not missing my opportunity here. So I was in the gym. I was running. I was doing my ball work. And I came back in tip-top shape. And we went on a tour to Ireland. I scored a few goals. We played sport in Lisbon. I scored a goal. I'm thinking, this is the year. And I'm going to have a good blast. This is the one I'm going to kick on, you know. And about a week before the season, he called me in to the office to say that, um, you know, he doesn't want to get rid of me, but he wants me to go on loan for a little bit because he thinks it'd be good for my kind of progression. Uh, he said, look, I can't promise you game time. If it was similar to last year, it's not good enough for your progression. So he said, go score 10, 15 goals somewhere, come back to me. And, um, you know, you've got a real chance of being a first team player here and have, making an impact. So, you know, he, he said, you've got a choice of a... I think Nottingham Forest had been on the phone, Leeds and Dundee United. So I said, look, what, what would you think? Like, give me some feedback. I didn't really want to go, but give me some feedback. So he said, look, obviously Nottingham Forest is my club and all. Brilliant, no problem. But he said, Dundee United, Craig Levine has been on the phone all all summer long. He wants you. He wants to build a team around you. Go up there to the SBL, score plenty of goals. And come back to me and, and kick on again, and, and you'll do great. And he, and he meant it; he was very genuine about it as well. But, um, but yeah, I, I kind of in my in the back of my head, it, it was kind of made up. Like that decision was kind of made up. I wish they had, had probably, you know, because by the time I came back, he he had gone; he, he wasn't the manager anymore. So when a new manager comes in, it's kind of different, you know. But I wish probably in the back of my mind that I kind of had dug my heels in and said, "No, look, I'll give it till Christmas. I'll give it a good go, and if I'm not getting game time." Then I go on now, but I, I was probably, you know, I was a bit raw to it all. You know, young lad, um, just want to play football. And, uh, you know, I'm hungry to play. And, and I went up to Dundee United to, to play, and I, the best of the best of intentions. But um, looking back on it now, probably mentally, I wasn't in the right place. I'd come from the best of the best in the Premier League in terms of facilities and the players I was surrounded by. You know, the people I was competing with for a striking spot at Sunderland was, you know, Andy Coles and, and Dwight York and all, and all this kind of stuff. And then I got up to Dundee United, and they didn't have their own training ground. And um, I think my head was my head wasn't kind of right. I kind of hadn't gotten around the fact that I was going on alone, and I kind of had a little bit of a there was a bit of friction there with me and the manager within the first few weeks because he left me out for a cup game, and I knocked on his door um, and kind of said, "You know, why are you leave me out for?" And I can understand why he left me out because I I probably wasn't invested in at the time. And then we kind of had a, there was a little bit of a standoff then for a few weeks, and. Uh, yeah, I just it just wasn't the the right move for me, and I kind of rushed into it, and I regret. But I, I learned, you know, I learned a valuable lesson. I I think in in the kind of from my second year at Sunderland, I went on three or four different loan moves, and I kind of rushed them. 
you know, look, I didn't do my research on the way the, the team played, the style of football they were playing. Um, you know, I and I kind of just wanted to play so much that I just jumped at things. And that's the kind of advice I'd give to young lads. No, stand back, do a bit of research. Do, do they play a style of football? If you're a striker, are they going to create a lot of chances for you? Are you going to have to graft really hard for every little touch of the ball you're going to get? And uh, I didn't do enough research. And, um, you know, I found out the hard way. But, you know, it's it's helped me later on in my career because when I've, went, when I've, I've made, a, made a few moves in my life, my wife will tell you. And uh, I've done my research, though, before I went now. And I make sure that the style of football suits me and it suits my personality. And, uh, you know, I've made more right decisions than, than wrong ones since, since the early days. Yeah, but that, as I say, you have to learn one way or another. And uh, at that point, you're only a young fella at, yeah. at the same time. And people can say whatever they like. I had Richie Towell on the other day and he said similar, like, you know, at, at Celtic, he knocked on Neil Lennon's door and says, I wanted to go on loan. And, you know, he was demanding things. And then just even Neil Lennon had to put him in his place. Like, do you know what I mean? Sometimes when you're that age, you do need, you're a bit, I uh, don't take this the wrong way. You're, you're young and you're probably a bit cocky and arrogant and you're just kind of like, oh, well, I'm better than what's going on here. And he said similar. Um, and sometimes you do need kind of that kick up the arse at the, uh, from a kind of older, wiser head, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, no, I don't take it as a, an insult at all because I used to get called an arrogant so so every Friday night from Damien Richardson. So I was, I, was well, I was well aware of what I was. But I think that it's a blessing and a curse as well. Look, you need, you need confidence in your own ability to go anywhere in anything in life, but especially in football, it's such a competitive industry, it's cutthroat, and you need to back yourself, you know, even when the chips are down, you're not playing great, or you're not in the team, the manager doesn't like you, you have to back yourself, so, um, so yeah, I look, I, I look at that as a positive, but I think managers would as well, as much as they'd give you a, a bollocking for coming into their office, and who do you think you are, they'd probably, they'd probably respect you for doing it as well, but, uh, but yeah, as you said, I think you learn more, you learn more in, in football from the bad days than you do from the good days, you know, the great days at Cork City when we're winning leagues and I'm scoring goals and I'm not thinking about much. It was all coming pretty naturally. But, you know, I go, you go on a bad loan move or you, you think yourself, I made the wrong choice here. Or they're playing very kind of direct football and I'm watching the ball over my head more than I'm getting it to feet or getting it in the box. And, and what am I doing? Like, those are the hard days that you learn about yourself and you have to get better at different things. You've got to get better at your heading. Your movement has to, has to be better. And, uh, you know, you, you learn a hell of a lot from from the games you lose and, and the bad spells, probably more so than the good ones. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And, and you hear so many people saying that as well, but it is one of those things, you know, to, to get better, you have to have not failures, but you kind of know what I mean. You, you kind of need the, the setbacks to make it the stronger player, if that makes sense. If you don't have setbacks and everything's rosy, you're just going to think, oh, yeah, upgrade, blah, 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 and carry on like that. And then before you know it, the, the rug can be taken from underneath you. Absolutely. I, I, I agree with you. I think, look, I think without any without failures, whatever call it, knockbacks, setbacks, uh, you don't learn much about yourself. You don't learn much about the game as well. I think with football, there's so many different ways and styles you can play. Um, and you kind of you become a, a bit more of a student of the game when you have to think about it. You know, If you've had it easy all your life and you've played in the best teams and you've just, you know, things are just, Kind of happened around you. You never really have to think about, oh, what's why is the fullback making that move in the midfielder? Just, just get me the ball. You know, you never had to think about it. But when you're not having great days and you're thinking about the style of football, why it's not working, you definitely think about, you know, why it's not working for you and and, and how it would be better for you. And you know, I uh, I've become a lot better player probably in the last ten years than I did in the first ten the first ten years of my career. And I, I'm talking about from school by football right through now as well there. Um. Certainly, the last ten years, I've really kind of fine-tuned and, and simplified my game. What am I good at? Uh, what wasn't I good at? What can I work on? And uh, just fine-tuned it. And you know, the results on the pitch have been better for that as well. You know, I, uh, you know, fine-tune your training, match day. What's important to me? You know, sprinting in the box, getting on the end of things, miss a chance, doesn't matter, get the next one. So uh, that's 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 pretty been, pretty simple formula for me, really. And uh, you know, it's what's worked for me, and I needed a few, you know, setbacks and uh, kicks up the arse along the way to to realise that. You no. Know? Yeah, but as you do in life, to be fair. But kind of talk to me about you know leaving Dundee. It obviously wasn't working out, um, and then going back to to Sunderland. What yeah, were they yeah. thinking? Because you went back out alone then twice again. Yeah, I went. I went. I, I went back 
be just basically to get out of Dundee United because it, it wasn't it wasn't a good environment for me at the time. It didn't didn't work and most to be honest with you, mostly my fault. You know, no qualms about that. It's mostly me. Uh, but I couldn't see that at the time. But uh, looking back now, it's probably my fault. And going back to Sunderland, but I knew I was going to be going on loan again. So um, there there was an opportunity to go to Blackpool. We were in the Championship at the time. Uh, I knew Wes had been there and done well. Um, and they were, but they were looking for a right winger at the time. Um, but again, I was desperate to play football. I said, yeah, yeah, I'll play in the right wing for you. So I went in and it was going really well. I went, got in the team, was playing every game, a few man the matches and the fans liked me there. Uh, and we won a few games. We started moving up the table uh, and I was really enjoying it. But uh, I got a appendicitis. We were about to play Sheffield United. And I'll never forget it. I was kind of, we were on the team bus and I kind of felt a bit tired all day. And we got to the, uh, the dressing room at, at Bramall Lane. And I was looking at the lads and I'm thinking, is it cold in here? Freezing here. But I was sweating as well at the same time. So physio was like, something not right with you here. So just before the warm, he brought me to see their, their club doctor. So uh, the club doctor kind of done the test on me. Get your pants off. Uh, it's me wrist. No, get your pants off. So he done the test on me for a for appendicitis. He was a specialist, luckily enough, and I got rushed to hospital. And I had an operation that night uh, to have my appendix out, and that kind of basically cur- curtailed the rest of my season. Um, I came back. I was after losing a lot of weight within a couple of months. Played a few games for the end. Of- I started against I think Swansea and in the derby against Preston. Uh, Charlie Adam scored the winner. So I don't know. Okay, but you know. I was chasing match fitness then, so that was kind of the end of that long. But I, I enjoyed it, and b- before I got kind of sick, it was it was terrific. And they asked me, actually, Blackpool asked me to go back the following year. Ian Holloway got the job, and they asked me to go back uh, in the pre-season because Steve Bruce had come in at Sunderland, and I was out, I was out of the picture. But I, I, I kind of, I know myself, I can play the right wing, and I'm, I'm decent there. I look, a professional up and down and do a job for you. But I've always, you know, backed myself as a, a goal scorer at number nine and I was going to wait I kind of was going to be a little bit more patient and wait for that opportunity to arise you know So how how did the rest of that go then because at the end of that season you imagine you're back then at Sunderland did they yeah. assess your loan period or what way does that happen Yeah yeah, well yeah with Steve Bruce had come in and obviously he's seen I was at Blackpool and uh, uh, Dundee United Dundee United obviously I, uh, I hadn't started the amount of games they would have wanted hadn't scored as many goals as they would have wanted and then he's sitting on to Blackpool and he's probably not even looking. There's no appendicitis on the farm or whatever. Like, it's like just probably wasn't a great season. So, um, you know, I, I came back pre-season. I gave my best, but they were signing a lot of players. Sunderland was spending a lot of money, big Premier League club. They had the finances and they wanted to to survive in the Premier League. And you had the likes of uh, Darren Bent came in the door. I think Gibraltar CC. So, it looked, there was big names coming in. And it was difficult for me to... Gian, did Gian sign then? No, that was later on. In the year after, but it just goes to show you, Bolo's end, and you had big names coming in the door. Jordan Henderson was uh, making headway, so he was. So you had Bolo's end and, and Jordan Henderson that were going to play on the wings. You had uh, Cissé, uh, Darren Bent, as strikers, and along with a few others, Cameron Jones, and these lads were still there. So it was, it was going big, to be big players, though. Yeah, exa- exactly. So look, it was it was no, it was no shame in that regard. But I needed to go and stand on my own two feet. I, I found uh, the League of Ireland wasn't getting the credibility. They weren't saying, "Oh, well, it, he's played a hundred games for for Cork City, scored forty odd goals, won leagues, been in cup finals." Kind of uh, League of Ireland kind of thing, you know that. I think there's that el- elitist thing as well regarding Irish football. We do it to ourselves. We shouldn't, you know, because it's, as I said to you earlier, it's a great product. But anyway, long story short, I was going to wait it for my opportunity as a striker. There wasn't many came along, really. Uh, didn't you know? I, I had a chance to got the Blackpool as a winger. Didn't really want. To, I said, "Let's dig my heels in." So, so, so then came came in for a month, a month's loan. So I said, "Yeah, I'll go look for a month's loan." Went down there, scored, uh, scored my my second game, I think. Uh, but it was only four games in a month. Scored a goal, went back. And then it was another two months. I was just playing the reserves at Sunderland, and uh, Hartlepool got in touch. Um, Joe Gamble, who obviously had played with Cork City, Leon McSweeney, Dennis Bean were at Hartlepool. It was twenty-five minutes down the road from my house in Sunderland, and uh, they were in League One. They needed a striker, and they called me up. Would you be interested? 
the lads speak highly of you and the uh, best move I ever made because that got me back in the scene in England. Uh, I went in there, scored a bag of goals. We stayed in League One, achieved our objective and uh, it was fantastic. It was, it was, it was, they played a great style of football. Chris Turner was the manager. Joe, obviously, Joe, Dennis and Leon, great buddies of mine. So all of, all of a sudden, that lads to bounce off. There was no that awkwardness that when you go into a new club, you, got, you know, find out the, the movers and shakers in the dressing room. But so it was great, and uh, yeah, I really enjoyed it. Really kickstarted me. Really got me going again. And um, yeah, as I said, I scored. I scored plenty of goals there. Number nine as a striker, and uh, yeah, it was. It gave me the opportunity, and you know, they they wanted me to resign. So my contract was coming to an end at Sunderland. Hartley people were saying, look, what's it going to take to keep you? And in fairness, they were they were offering really good money for for what they were. Like in fairness, uh, and I, I said, look, I'd love to, but. Again, ambition comes into a Coventry, who were in the championship, who had history there as a youth team player. I wanted to go there and right some wrongs and prove a few, few people wrong. Came in finished business. Exactly, exactly. So, And I met Eddie Boothroyd, who I thought was outstanding, an impressive guy. And yeah, I, I, I signed for Coventry. And uh, no, looking at it, no, that it, it probably wasn't the right move for me. Um, but look, you live and die by your mistakes, and uh, you learn from them. And I definitely, you know, learned along the way again. Um, I think Eddie had a great time for me as well. I went there, and you know, he really wanted to play two up front, and he wanted to play kind of a big man, little man, and play a really kind of um, attacking brand of football. But start of the season, I think it Lucas Djukovic and uh, Freddie Eastwood, and then Marlon King. Uh, we were top of the league by January. I had made a couple of appearances off the bench, started in the League Cup game. But he genuinely, he couldn't get me in the side. And, and I don't blame him. He couldn't change the team. He wasn't one for changing. Um, and, um, you know, the longer I went on, I kind of, I was kind of on the bench. I was I was back up. But he lost his job in the, in the February then. We, we went from top of the league, I think third in the league in, in nearly late January to, we, were, we, didn't, we didn't win a game for about two and a half months. Um, and he lost his job, which was very sad because everybody liked Eddie actually at the club, and I, I really liked him myself. Even though I hadn't played a lot, I knew he would. I knew I would break in there under him. Uh, but he lost his job, and then the new manager came in after him, and they're kind of saying, "Well, this fella, Eddie signed him. He hadn't played a lot. I'm going to do. I'm going to do things like like so many other other clubs. They'll throw the baby with the bathwater. I'm going to sign my own strikers, my own players, and uh, again, I'm down to pecking order again." Uh, and besides a loan to Hibs, which was good, Pat Fenlon was there. I went up there, got some match fitness. Uh, I had come back, come back from an injury, went up to Hibs, I broke my foot, went up to Hibs, and I played about uh, eight or nine games, only started five, scored a couple of goals up there. Um, and it was okay. It was just what I needed, really, uh, to go back to England. It was always a short term loan, a couple of months up there, back to England. And AD Boothroyd was on the phone again to come back to. Um, to come back to play play under him. He said, we'll do it right this time. I made a big mistake at Coventry. If I had played you more at Coventry, I probably wouldn't have lost my job. Um, so that was great. Like he was kind of, not many people are, whether he meant it or not, I think he did. He's quite a genuine bloke. He felt I could have offered more. I was a character he should have gotten his team at Coventry and he wanted to write that wrong at Northampton. And I went to Northampton and uh, yeah, it was a great spell. A great season there. Um, you know, I, believe, I was leaving Coventry again. Only scored one goal in the in, in the first team there. I'd only probably started probably 10, 15 games in a couple of years. And, you know, and when I did start games, I played as a winger. I actually played a lot of games as a centre midfielder. I'm not even related to a centre midfielder, but anyway, that's just how it worked out. Uh, but anyway, AD wanted me back, went to Northampton, and, and I kind of, as again, it was perfect for me, just what I needed at that time. But he was uh, like, he's a a big name in English football like he was, he was he was the England or is he the England under 21 manager now yeah 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 and then he was obviously at Watford and a few other clubs as well so the fact that he really rated it must have been a massive compliment uh, it was great, for yourself and it was great I mean, honestly well, as you said because he, he was a big name and uh, he had he'd done really well at, at Watford he'd re, like he had high raps like they, they were talking about for the England gaffer even then as one of the youngest you know managers around in the Premier League but uh, I liked I liked the way he went about his business. I liked he wasn't one for change in his style. He you know he he kind of stuck to his kind of squad of 15, 16 players. He didn't really 
rotate too much, which went against me at Coventry. But he was kind of saying I made a bit of a mistake there. Come to Northampton and, you know, we're building something here. And he was true to his word. I went there. I liked the way he worked. You know, he got people around him. He, you know, he, people knew their job with, with AD. And he, he had a good positive energy. Good, there was good vibes around the place. And, uh, yeah, that, that season, we had a good side. We had Clark Calli was the captain and myself, uh, Clive Platt and uh, Akin Fenua up front. So uh, I was the little one out of, out of those two, obviously. Um, but it was good. I scored plenty of goals. We got to the playoff final. Um, and it was outstanding that first season. Um, and I, I, yeah, I loved I loved playing Andre. Actually, I, I I just it was um, it was a shame it didn't work out at Coventry, but I was I was glad to get an opportunity again at Northampton with him. Yeah, I could tell even by looking at you there, the smile on your face when you when you bring up his name, it kind of brings a bit of a light to your face. So he obviously had a huge impact on you. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely did, and uh, I learned a lot. I, I, we had happy days as well, you know. I, 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 he, uh, you know, he was always he was always chipper. You you lose a game, it was no big deal. We learn from it, we move on. You know, it was always positive. You know, you could do this better, you could do that better. But at the end of the day, we're all we're all in it together. He did. He hadn't forgotten what it was like to be a football player. You know, I think he, some people sometimes people go into management and they forget. You know, sometimes it's difficult to be a football player. So you have to kind of you have to have a little bit of give and take, and you know, kind of be on their side sometimes. You know, and uh, Aidy was good at that. He, he was good at getting players on his side and getting them to kind of um, give him 100%. And, and he got the best out of people. And um, he certainly did for me. He gave me a new lease on life there. And I, I again, I played sometimes on the wing for him, sometimes up front. And I was happy to do that because he was he was a good bloke. And, um, you know, we, we were striving for things. And we were lucky not to get promoted that year. We lost that in, at Wembley that year. And the following season... Uh, I extended my contract, so did he. Uh, we lost. I think his budget got cut, slashed massively. They were building, they were extending the stadium. And we lost uh, Clark Carlisle, who was our skipper, Akin Fenwa and uh, Ben Harding, our centre midfielder. So the spine of our team went and they didn't, they didn't give him the kind of the funds to replace them. And I got injured. I, I ended up going for an operation and I missed most of almost half a season. And uh, when, by the time I came back, Eddie was getting the sack. We, just results just weren't happening, and, and you know it was a shame. Really, nobody wanted to see him go again. He was great, and it was just going through a bad spell. But that's what opened the door to go to 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 Asia to Brunei because I know that's where your next question is going to aim at. Uh, I got a phone call out of the blue from from an ex teammate of mine to to go there. So, from from your point of view. Uh, you're leaving England. You're, mm-hmm. It's not really that you know that well known for an Irish player to go over there, especially at that point in time. So mm-hmm. you probably you probably made the pathway for for a lot of players to go out that way. What was the what was the thinking behind the move? I know you're about to tell me there that your your mate got on to you, but yeah. at this point, were you were you with your wife at this point, or had you found her? Yeah, we we were, and that's the big thing. I mean, this is the human aspect of football as well. We had just got married. So we played a playoff final at Northampton, got married in, this, in that summer back in Cork. And uh, we'd bought a house uh, in, in rugby in England, uh, you know, kind of trying to settle down, do normal family things, have think about having kids and all. And here's me then, six months down the track, uh, six months into a two-year contract at Northampton. And I'm saying, uh, George O'Callaghan just rang me there, already blue. And he said, would I be interested in going to Brunei? And she goes, Where, where's Brunei? And I said, that's what I asked him. Um, and uh, I kind of because when, when George rang originally, I, I kind of said, Nah, George, nah, I'm, not, I'm only 28. I said, well, what, Why am I going to Brunei? I said, I, I, Look, I want to play abroad, there's no doubt about that. It's always, it's always been in my mind, but Brunei, like, why Brunei? And yeah, in fairness to him, he, he was he was relentless, he didn't stop calling me. And, and eventually, then we got to talk in brass tacks and what's the contract. And as I said earlier, I was coming back from an injury as well at Northampton, so I was just back from having the double hernia surgery and had an ankle injury. And he was saying, look, the season is starting here in February. He said, it goes February to October. He said, it's this the end of January transfer window. Go over there, score a bag of goals, and we'll get you back to England. And you can kick on again, fully fit, ready to go in, in October. So I said, yeah, it's a good point. So, um, so yeah, so I made the move, made the move over there. Uh, as I said, that shit. My wife shed a few tears, but she was good as gold. She was a, uh, 
she she went with the flow and we moved over there. And Joe Gamble was there as well. He was just signing, uh, who had obviously had a great success playing with a Cork and Hartley Pool. And uh, I get on with Joe. He's, he's a great lad as well. So um, he was going there. So that was going to make it a bit more comfortable. Uh, and Steve Keane was the coach there. So it was going to be a British coach. So it was going to be something that, uh, you know, I'd be used to. And uh, yeah, it worked out really well. I had every intention of going there, coming back to England in October and kicking on because I was in, you know, it was a great age, 28, 29, still relatively young, still all ahead of me. But, you know, when, when I went over to Asia and I was scoring goals and we were travelling around and really enjoying it and I got to get a bit more kind of balance away from football as well. And it was, just, it was perfect to live there for an athlete because it was a dry state, so you couldn't drink. So all you could do really is throw yourself into your training. So there was five foreigners. We had some Brazilians. We had... Um, a couple of Eastern Europeans, a Croatian, a Serbian at the back, myself and Joe, and uh, Steve Keane is the gaffer. And uh, it was fantastic. That's Steve Keane that was with uh, Blackburn? Yeah, that's right, yeah. So he, oh. was, he was great. He was great. He was really good to talk to. He was a really good coach. And uh, the nine lads were actually better than I expected. Uh, physically, not huge, but um, technically very good. You know, they're very jinky, had a great drop of the shoulder, and they're sharp. So you mix that with the kind of the foreigners that we brought in. Obviously, we had a Serbian defender, Croatian midfielder, tough, Joe, tough, small but tough. Uh, and uh, myself and another Brazilian lad up front. Um, and yeah, we scored some goals. We enjoyed our football. Steve Arquino wanted us to enjoy our football and we did. But again, like George was like, coming to October, he's like, I, I, do you want to go back to England? Like, There's a there's a few sniffs. Like, you're, you're, I sure 20-odd goals. Like, There's a few sniffs. Do you want to go back to England? And he was had this full Asian hat on, and I was like, "Do you know what? I don't really." And I, they offered me another year there as a the marquee player to sign off another year, and I, I was thinking about signing. And in between that, George got uh, the general manager role in Malaysia at a team called Saba, and he was saying, "Come over here, play, play for me. I'm the general manager. I get a new gaffer in there. I'm trying to get Keane in." I don't think Steve Keane wanted to leave Brunei, uh, so it'll be you and Haj Juf up front. Uh, Andy Foy, and if we can get Joe over there as well. So it was all happening anyway. But I said, no, look, I'm happy in Brunei, but I'll come over and see you. I went over to, to Saba, which is a 20-minute flight, because Malaysia was their biggest rival, Brunei and uh, Saba. But I got photographed at the airport. I um, don't know. I don't know. Was it a setup or what? Anyway, I got photographed at the airport. It was on newspaper in Malaysia. And football is huge over there as well. People in, in Europe, or Ireland probably don't know, but... They'll have 80,000 at their games in some of the games in Malaysia and over that part of the world. Anyway, it was in the newspaper and it gets back to the Crown Prince and the Sultan of Brunei who, who owned my team pretty quickly and it was a little bit embarrassing for them. So they distanced themselves from me. They said, oh, that, that, that contract is gone now. We don't want you back because you that was disrespectful. So then I kind of said to, to George, Look, I'm not signing here. And even, even though I haven't got a contract in Brunei anymore and I enjoyed it. It's got 20 odd goals. Uh, MVP, all that kind of stuff, and it kind of it got me thirty odd games in a row, which I hadn't had since Cork City. Real a real block of games, leagues and cups, and we had a bit of success. We won a cup over there. Uh, I didn't want to sign then in, in, in Malaysia because it looked like I was angling for a move to Malaysia. So in the end, look, I, I ended up signing. Uh, I had some offers from Australia, but their season wasn't starting for a few months. The Indonesian Super League was starting in the interim. I said I'll give it a go. And I went over there and the last of six weeks um, the league got cancelled. There was some government interference in Indonesia and I was so thankful because it was the longest six weeks of my life. Nobody spoke English. I, the players were just too laid back. Like, you know, I'm, I'm so driven and, and, and ambitious and I want training to be done right. And we were doing it right in Brunei and then to go there, it, just, it was all a bit sloppy, a bit laid back and no matter what money you could be put in front of people. I just thought I wasn't. I wouldn't have been happy there. Anyway, long story short, league got cancelled, and they gave me the opportunity to go to Australia. And um, yeah, here, here I am, uh, four and a half years down the track. Well, at that, at that time, had you just had you given up on England? I think I, I think it was on uh, Fans Voice uh, TV. You were saying about like the quality. Sometimes you kind of have to weigh it up the quality of living. To your football ambition and kind of get the balance. And I, I know from from traveling myself. I lived in, you know, Canada uh, 
America and and Australia. Now I didn't really like Australia at the time, but I was quite young. But the fact that, as you say, you were at a good age going over there, and you're kind of you have your partner with you. So at that point, you must be thinking. I assume you were 29 at this point because you'd have a couple of yeah. long moves and yeah. and that or not long moves, sorry, a couple of moves. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, they go from there. I suppose at that point you were probably thinking, you know, there's there's a good life for me here in Australia. No, I don't know. I'm just I, I'm just thinking out the top of my head. You can let me know, but you must have been thinking, you know, there's a good quality life here. You know, Australia is a beautiful, beautiful country. Like, yeah, no, you're spot on. You nailed it there. Uh, that's what I learned when I moved away from England. And, and you know, in England, and you, you have that ambition and drive, and you want to win games. And but it's tough. Like you, you play if you're keeping yourself fit, which is hard enough in itself, and staying in the team. You're playing fifty odd games a year, which takes its toll on you. And it's you know, it's pissing down and rain most of the year in England. And it's you know, by the time you know December comes, the pitches start to rip up, and it you know it becomes a bit of a dog fight, especially in the lower leagues as well. You know, Championship, League One, whatever. But uh, Australia was perfect for me because, as you said, it's a beautiful place. I had watched it a bit, a bit of their football and the standard of their football, so I rated it. Like, I thought it was good. And it just was perfect. Like, you know, I am financially, financially was fine. You know, you can make a good living here uh, if, you, if you've got something to offer. But I just think the life work balanced. You know, I go train and train hard, ticks all up them boxes. We're trying to achieve something. The standard of football is really, really good. A lot higher than people think. You have to be extraordinarily fit, which suits me because I, I like to train hard and, and test myself. But when training finishes and the games finish, it's, a, it's the sun is shining. It's a beautiful place to live. Uh, Ellen gave birth over here, so we had a baby boy who was, was born in Australia, and he doesn't know any different. He, I don't think he's seen a day's rain in his life. So it's... Uh, in, in that in that in that kind of aspect for us it's perfect perfect age and you know I've had a few clubs in, in Australia now um as well but I've really got a lot of time for, for the A League and, and just for, you know as Irish players as well I think we need to you know expand our horizons like you know not England's not the be all end all for everybody either you know for all the people that leave and go and want to say I want to be playing the Premier League it's hard and it's getting harder and harder to to get, I was lucky. I, I made some appearances in the Premier League and had a taste of English football, but not everybody's that lucky. And I think people need to start looking further afield, especially young lads. You know, I'd like to see the National League get stronger and a pathway that they, they go through the, the academies uh, and all the age groups into the League of Ireland team and move on. That'd be great. But you know, look look outside that. Can can we get players playing in in, in Belgium, in Spain, in Holland if they're really technical players? is going to the Championship in England or, or whatever, clubs like that, that play very direct football, is that going to suit a very technical Irish player? So uh, it suits me anyway, uh, to make a long story short, playing in Australia, they play a good style of football. They're physical, the Aussies are physical, like the Irish, they get stuck in, they're competitive. But uh, the, the style of football, there's a lot of international players coming here, you're going to have five foreigners, there's a salary cap, there's a lot of TV money floods in, and it makes a really good product. And... Uh, that suited me, the kind of style of football. And uh, I've scored plenty of goals over here. I'm still scoring goals. I'm, I'm loving loving life and loving football. Yeah, well, I, I went over there in 2012. And I think the marquee player in the league at the time was Brett Emerton. He used to play at Blackburn. Uh, he was really? playing with Sydney FC. And yeah. then you talk, there's the, since then, there's been, you know, Damien Duff's gone to, went to Melbourne and Del Piero went to Sydney. And there's been players like that. Uh, David Villa, he went to Melbourne as well, I think. Never City, yeah. 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 Um, so there's really, you know, top class players there. It's kind of similar in a way to the MLS. They, I think they're trying to do something similar there. Yeah, yeah. Very, very similar. Very similar, really, that they're trying, they're trying to get the big names. Last year, the, the marquee was uh, Honda, Kazuki Honda, the Japanese. Yeah. Last, uh, you had, obviously, Del Piero, Robbie Fowler, Heskey down, down, down the track. But to be fair, like in the last five years, the league has got a lot more physical. So they're not going for the, the, the kind of aging stars as such that come in with a big price tag and physically probably aren't delivering the numbers and the stats they used, they used to. So the kind of foreign players that are coming in here tend to be a lot younger now. Uh, and they mightn't have the, the as big a names as, as the ones I just mentioned, but they, they still, they're hungry. And as I said, you've got to be fit to play here. So um, the, the the league is really good. 
it's a glossy product, you know, it's vibrant, there's a lot of media attention on it. Um, but uh, it, look, it is, it's a good It's a good style of football. I mean, the teams I play for here, uh, especially at Newcastle, just they play really kind of, you know, attacking football. They want to get the ball down, they want to play when it's on. If not, they turn teams around. Quick wingers, they try and get the ball in the box, they're trying to get the ball behind defenders. Right up my alley, you know. I can be a nuisance to defenders all day and make my runs and get in the box that other people um that a lot of people do all the kind of the donkey workers such the wingers, the, the overlapping fullbacks, midfielders, the West Hoolands of this world trying to unlock defences for me and I take all the glory then with the odd tap in here and there. So no, so I actually think the first game, or, or the first A League game, only A League game was Sydney against Newcastle. I think Michael Bridges was playing for them at the time. Yeah, but yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And so uh, there you go. Yeah, it was and yeah, Brett Everton and was Dwight, was Dwight York playing the City then? I was no, he had he gone back to he probably no, he probably finished. I think he city. might have got back to England. Yeah, yeah, maybe you're right. Yeah, yeah, but uh, but yeah, was it was a decent game? Like, I mean, I I think even since then, actually the league has advanced. Massively, oh, 100 percent, 100 percent, yeah, way more. Yeah, but I'd say the crowds were good even then. Like, it was probably full stadiums and that. Like, I was lucky a guy I met just playing football because over there you can just go to a local park and they'll just have like a drop in game of football and you'd be playing with lads from everywhere England, Scotland, all these kind of lads who just came over that they, they made a life over there. Do you know what I mean? So, we went, one of them took me into his box and we went to see Sydney against uh, the, the, the Jets at the time. I thought it was brilliant. I loved it. Like any sort of football game, I was like, "Yes, get me to it." You know, yeah, so I, was, cool. I loved it. Yeah, yeah, it's good. And it's I, I my 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 point of view is it's everything that the League of Ireland could be. You know. Yeah. And the difference is uh, financial backing, and you get to bring in. You know, with that fire. No, I know it's not going to happen overnight for the League of Ireland, and I, we're talking about building blocks. But like, if you've got a little bit of TV deal, I'm not talking about. Over here, every club gets about four four million dollars a year off the TV company, uh, which means they pay sixty million TV deal every year. Sixty million, that's not going to happen in Ireland right now. But if they get some sort of TV deal that pays some bills, you know, it might only be five percent. You know, they start to get some grants from the government that they can get their own training base and maybe start to think about building or buying their own stadiums down the track. Um, you know, that could be. A huge future for and you could you get better players into the league because of that you know the finances go up you you get you know you become a bit of a draw but it, it, as i said there's there's good people in, in at play at the moment in, in ireland and i think the mls and, and the a league is everything that they should aspire to be because uh we've certainly got the talent as a country coming through we, we always had done we, we've always uh you know had a great history of creating players and you only have to look at the history of the premier league to see that but um our own league, we're quick to knock our own, and uh, every great international team has a very strong national league. And uh, if we're going to be serious moving forward, we need to help our own national league. Yeah, no, I, I think you're 100. percent I love the way you speak about the league and how you want it to be better. And obviously, with your own experiences, you've seen how this can happen. And, and I, you know, I think back to what you first said about the kind of build and the blocks. Because even back then, the standard was wasn't that great. The game I was at, mm -hmm. there was a couple of good players there, but it's it's it exceeded all of my expect expectations now when I see it, and I'm just like, wow! Like the the sponsorship deals, the 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 TV deals, as you say. Now, obviously, the population is is far smaller here, mm -hmm. so you won't get the money you're speaking of. And I know you're not saying that in an yeah. Irish sense, yeah. But it it, it it's as I say, start off small and work your way up. But it's even just getting the TV, uh, the stuff on TV in general. I, I mean, I don't see why someone like Sky Sports can't get, like, because they do a lot of Irish stuff. They do the GAA. I don't see why they can't get on board and do something with, with the League of Ireland. I don't know what is holding it back. Like, we're yeah. not allowed, from our channel point of view, we're not allowed to put any sort of goals or anything up or, or we can be, like, going for copyright. So we can't yeah. push it out there even to a further audience yeah. um, who might who might only follow us and not, say, the, the League of Ireland Instagram account or YouTube account, you know, type of way. So it's tough yeah. trying to... Yeah. We're trying to do it, but we can't put any highlights or anything like that. And we can only just put, like, pictures up, yeah. if that makes sense. And people are really... Like, well, oh. That makes sense because people like ourselves, are, you know, want the best for it, but you're restricted. You're, you, you're trying to help with your hands tied, you know? 
Uh, and okay. I, I think, I, th- I honestly, genuinely do think, and I'm not just saying it as a soundbite, I think that is going to change and that, that's going to come very soon. Uh, I know Niall, and obviously as, as an ex-player, that's fantastic. He knows the game. He knows what's important, you know, for from grassroots up to senior level football. But also from a commercial side of things, I think he's very tuned in to how we can make money and tap into the talent that we have in the League of Ireland and help the Irish national team, men's and women's. And um, so I think that's that's going to happen. But as you said, it takes time. There is building blocks. But even look, small things, I'm always, when there is a game on TV, which as you said, is all too infrequent, when it is on the TV, if the game, for example, that Turner's Cross, they, they kind of film it from the big stand looking down at Derry Nan, the low, the low stand. And no matter how good the product is on the pitch, it, it kind of looks like a conference game and people that, you know, have a basic understanding of football, they're watching it and they're thinking, ah, sure, that's, you know, it's only League of Ireland, like it's no level. So, and I think it's little fixes to, to help the product in the short term. It's like flipping the camera around, putting it on the Derry Nan stand, looking at the big, the big kind of the main stand uh, at Turner's Cross, for example, as an example. And you're seeing it's a full stand. People love their football. Uh, you know, and it it just makes it a more appetising product for, for other people to say, Jesus, it's full house there. I'm going to go to the next League of Ireland. I'm going to go to Daily Mount. I'm going to go to Talca. You know, I'm going to go and watch Shamrock Rovers play at Dundalk, whoever. There's the little steps along the way that need to be done because uh, if it's going to be taken seriously, these little changes need to be, um, you know, put in place. Well, I think that's the thing, isn't it? Market and advertising is huge and social media plays a big part, but I just don't see enough advertisement in my point of view like looking at it and obviously I do a lot of work in this industry and I'm just looking at like you look at the Premier League it's everywhere if we had something in Ireland where I know it's not going to be amazing but if you put if you put the stuff in front of people they're going to watch it but any football game they're going to watch it regardless yeah. and the problem is there's not enough of it or it's, it's very little in regards yeah. now I know Air Sport have tried to ramp up a little bit and fair play mm-hmm. to them they've tried to really get you know some coverage but Again, you have to pay a subscription to that, and so not everyone has air sport. You know what I mean? So yeah. it's tough. Which doesn't help. But look again, the, the paper media in Ireland have always been very good. You know, you, yeah. you get your you got your pullouts leading into a, a game, and you get some, you get plenty of coverage. You know, uh, the local papers, you know, whatever the Herald in uh, Dublin, the Echo in Cork, and, and and right around the country, you get that local support. And people people know, but the people that go to the games, they're like a steadfast. League of Ireland supporter, you know, you've got your solid base. But, like, as a, as a nation, we love our sport, we love our football, and, and rugby was probably a prime example. Rugby, in the early 2000s, when it went professional, uh, there, there wasn't many people going to, to Cork Con games or whatever. Like, it was similar to League of Ireland in that regard. But then it became Munster, Leinster, Ulster, Connacht. This Heineken Cup became, like, the Champions League. They're playing at packed out stadiums, People, everyone's a Munster fan, you know, especially down the country. everyone's a Munster fan all of a sudden, they love their rugby, like, so it's the, I think the, the League of Ireland, we love our sport, we love our football, everyone's a Man United, Liverpool, Celtic fan, whatever it is, we've got to get them into League of Ireland grounds, and as you said, it comes with the media stuff, but it comes with the little, little bit of support as well, highlights on social media, uh, coverage ga- coverage of games, you know, little um, clippets and um, you know, little packages for on Instagram or whoever the best players at the moment, Jack Bourne, whoever's scoring the goals in the League of Ireland, whoever it is, you need the hype machine going, similar to what the Premier League has. But um, as I said, hopefully no better, no better boy than, than Niall Quinn, hopefully to, to get things motoring and, and, you know, loosen a few restrictions. Yeah, well, that's it. Because I was at a Q&A up there at the dock. They were doing an exhibition on the Irish football history. It was to do with the Euros. And Noel was up on stage saying he was trying to get something sort of with Virgin Media and stuff like that. And the stuff's pending in the back of it. I don't know what's going to happen now because of the virus. But we'll wait and see what happens. But kind of just to kind of finish off with your, with your career, you had the moves in Australia. So you were at uh, Central Coast Mariners. How was the time there? And then leading into your time at Brisbane. Uh, sorry, the Jets, Brisbane, and then back to the Jets. And then I want to talk to you about your bromance with uh, Mr. Houlihan oh, right yeah. at the end. Uh, well, look, uh, obviously, when I came over here, it was a case Ellen Ellen uh, was pregnant. So um, it was a case that there was a contract at Central Coast Mariners. It wasn't, look, again, it wasn't huge money really coming in the door, but it was fine. It was entry-level kind of stuff uh, for a foreign player. And I said, all right, I'll give it, I'll give it a go. They weren't, they're not the biggest club in the A League. They weren't the biggest, definitely weren't the biggest spending club. Uh, but I came in, 
for two years and uh, I hit the ground running. Uh, uh, I scored, I think, 20, 20 goals for, for the Mariners in, in, in 40 games. Uh, and then, you know, uh, in between all that, I, I had a couple of suspensions here and there. I never lost that, that kind of edge. Um, and, you know, I, I had my ups and downs in Australia as well as had it in England. But uh, I had a, an opportunity then at the end of my contract to go to Newcastle Jets, who would be the biggest rivals of Central Coast Mariners. It was a, a big no-no. But, you know, they they offered me a good deal. They were trying to have a go at winning the competition, which I knew the Mariners weren't trying to do. And they really wanted me. So, um, yeah, I went up, up the motorway. Uh, it's about 45 minutes up the motorway, signed for the nearest rivals. Um, and my first game back, uh, as fate would have it, was against the Central Coast Mariners at their place, uh, full stadium. They unfurled a big a big flag for the game of, of my, a big, I swear, about 50-foot banner of my head on a snake. For, for going to the nearest rivals and uh, I scored a hat trick in the in the first twenty eight minutes of the game just to kind of shut them up a little bit. So uh, <laughs> I, I endeared myself to my new fans on my debut and uh, yeah I'm one of the all time top goal scorers for for Newcastle Jets. But yeah come at the end of uh, at the contract last year I uh, two years uh, scored plenty of goals um, and again we got to a grand final we just missed out and win the league. Uh, so we had some success as well. Uh, they only offered me a one-year extension rather than the two years I was looking for. And it kind of got a bit, you know, one of these things, it kind of got a bit awkward. And in the end, the one-year contract became a no-year contract. We kind of fell out. It went down about 12, 13 weeks. I wanted this. I wanted an option of a second year, which I think was in my right. I didn't you know what score goals for them. And... Um, Again, it just wasn't there. They said financially they couldn't do this, couldn't do that. So Brisbane Brisbane Roar came in, who would be one of the bigger clubs in, in Australia. Robbie Fowler was obviously a big draw uh, and he was trying to rebuild as well. So he was trying to... I was going to be the main player coming in the door. I was with the marquee name coming in for them in the A-League and they signed another uh, 12 or 13 players. So it was a big rebuild. Um. And look, I, I enjoyed it. It was a good club. I got to live in the Gold Coast for a little while. And um, yeah, it just, you know, I talk, because again, I come back to, I done my research on people before I signed in the clubs. And Brisbane Roar, were always a team that played a really vibrant style of football. They're, they're all about imposing themselves on the opposition and, and, you know, hurting the opposition, trying to score goals, attractive football. And they were called Roar Salona at one stage, you know, that's the, you know, they, that's the kind of football they were trying to play. So I was delighted. I'd be the number nine in that get plenty of chances but Robbie coming in Brisbane Roar the previous season had conceded a lot of goals he wanted to make them really structured and defensive I'm thinking signing for Robbie Fowler he was the most instinctive natural goal scorer of his generation I'm thinking this is going to be right up my alley here I'm going to get loads of chances and it's going to be just just get in the box do my thing like you know but it it became I kind of so structured we ended up like a lot of the times we were playing five at the back uh, I was kind of a low, ended up being a lone striker. They were, uh, kind of, you know, kind of quite defensive. And then even at, as that striker, I was kind of finding he wanted me to kind of show up for every ball and drop in as a number ten. And you know, I've never been a number ten, but you know, I can drop in, hold the ball up here and there, and get involved in the play like any striker. But most of the time, when that ball goes wide or a midfielder gets his head up, I want to run behind. And I don't think Robbie really the way he wanted to play the style wanted to risk possession at all. And it just didn't suit the way I wanted to play because I'm quick, I want to get behind and I want to get in the end of things in the box. And midway through the season, uh, I'd scored seven goals in 11 games. So I was, I'm, not, I'm still a top scorer now, even though I haven't played a game in months for them. Uh, it just wasn't right. The, the energy wasn't right. Uh, and I had an opportunity to come back to Newcastle Jets. Who, as I said, I didn't want to leave originally. And uh, yeah, I'm delighted I came back here. Wes Houlihan was here. Joe Ledley was just coming coming in. New manager in Carl Robinson. So there was a couple of things as well happening at Newcastle Jets. Fans like me here. So yeah, I've come back here. We It's been great. We've been winning games. Again, I've been scoring goals. And I've got to kind of link up with Wes, which I've been wanting to do since he was at uh, Shelburne back in the day. So it's been great. Um, uh, you know, we've been winning it. The only downfall is this this COVID-19, and that's the same for everyone. But uh, yeah, so as I said, before you asked me, I get to... 
to to train and play with Wes every day, and we're we're keeping fit every day. Uh, and he, he's the same now as he was at Shelburne. He wants to win everything. He's competitive. Whether we're playing tennis on the bikes, doing our little bit of a uh, football training, he wants to win head tennis. So uh, yeah, he's been he's been great, and he's a, he's a good lad as well. He's very humble for all his achievements. Very humble, and he's the he's, he's down to work and a good lad. So. Do you ever talk about the old rivalry with Cork and Shells? Does that come up a lot? <laughs> I did. I didn't want to bring it up to him at the very start because I've my 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 go to tactic on the right wing against Wes on the left for Shells and Paddy McCourt on the left for for Derry, the, and Kifahi probably for Pats as well. Ooh, my kind of sign of respect was I'll kick him early on, try and put him in the stand early on and see how they how they like it. You know, that was my kind of way of getting my own imposing myself on the game back in the day, but. Uh, He's good as goal, actually. It was great. We we've got a good relationship, and we just talk, actually talk about the old days back in back in League of Ireland, the players, the characters that play, and uh, it was good times for both of us. He he tells me actually because he was in the League of Ireland before me, Dermot Keeley before Pat Fenlon and and some of the players when he started. Tony Sheridan, he was telling me how good he was at at oh, Sheridan yeah. when he first when he first broke through, and just some of the characters that 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 were there at the time. But um. As I said, yeah, look, good times, and I think we both have a very positive experience in League of Ireland, and you know we're, we're both of the same ilk and thinking that the League of Ireland should be well ahead of where it is right now. You know, the, as I said, on the pitch, the quality is there, and the likes of Jack Byrne back in League of Ireland doing well, Sean Grove has done dark. There's no doubt about the quality on the pitch, but I, I mean as a as a league and as a brand, it should be way ahead of where it is right now. But um, but yeah, we've we've got a bit. We have a bit of crack. He gives me a bit of stick about the clashes I had with all his teammates. He, he, I think he had a, a black a black book of lists and names going through. Did you ever have a fun up with X Y Z along the way? So I'm just, I'm just, yes, 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 yes. Every single one of them. Yeah, pretty much, pretty much. But that was that was that was a happy day. Yeah, well, uh, and I also see the you were playing tennis there the other week, and he cracked you in the head with that tennis ball. That was payback, payback. You know what I mean? So. He says he doesn't resent what happens at us Cork City win the league in 05, but he obviously does. He obviously does, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, listen, um, it's great to hear that you, you're enjoying just life in general because obviously you get your ups and downs in England and stuff like that. And, yeah. you know, it seems like you're enjoying a quality way of life in Australia. Do you see your future pretty much in Australia now or what way are you thinking? Yeah, I do. I do really. I I, I feel like we've, we've made a life here. The, the football side of things, it's it's been great for us and we like the lifestyle. But uh, in football, you never know, really. You, you can never, I, I don't know, I've learned that along the way. You can never make plans too far in advance because, you know, they end up changing pretty quickly. It depends on what I do, you know, moving on after football and what have you. But um, at the moment, I'm quite confident in saying that I'll be here for a while yet. Uh, I enjoy living in Australia. We've made it home, I think. Alfie, my young lad's going to go to school here in the new year and all that kind of stuff. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, I've got years left of me football wise. I'm feeling good and feeling strong. So yeah, I don't feel like going anywhere too soon. Excellent stuff. Well, listen, I've kept you for nearly an hour and a half, but I've enjoyed every single minute of it. It's been fantastic. Thanks very much for, for coming on the show with us, Roy. Cheers, Paul. Absolute pleasure, man. Thank you.